This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. It's a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, George Ogeman from uh, University of Washington, Seattle. And George is one of those few people who have the uh, privilege and huge responsibility of looking into the brains of living humans. And so we move now from some massive genomic complexity into one of those parts that makes us all individuals, the, the functioning brain. Thank you very much. We're going to really have to change our orientation for a moment here in that the, uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, is, uh, does not involve genes in any way. Uh, we're going to talk about biodiversity in the structure and particularly the function of the uh, uh, human brain is related to language. And uh, we're going to uh, speculate a little bit on how this might have arisen uh, and uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, a little bit on the, uh, the comparing it to uh, uh, the situation in uh, monkey and uh, in, in uh, the rat. Uh, okay, uh, when I was learning neuroanatomy, which is a little over 50 years ago, uh, it was generally thought that the cerebral cortex of uh, humans was exactly the same on the two sides of the brain. Uh, indeed, in one of the standard neuroanatomy texts, the one by Elizabeth Crosby and colleagues, uh, the way they made their photographs is that they had a single negative and they simply reversed it when they wanted to look at the right or the left. Uh, now, it's subsequently, and it really, uh, even though it was, how'd that happen? Let's go back. There. Uh, even though it was known that uh, uh, there were examples of asymmetries uh, that were present earlier, it was, uh, it was really not until this paper by Norman Yeshwin back at the, in the end of the 60s that it sort of dawned on everybody that that simply was incorrect, that the two sides of the brain have major asymmetries. And the one that, that Dr. Yeshwin pointed out particularly is this thing called the, air, the planum temporale. And he, he pointed out that it is uh, larger on the left side than the right in a, about 70% of people. Of course, more than 70% are left brain dominant, but uh, nonetheless, this was, and, and the, let's say the function of this area is still not totally known. Uh, but nonetheless, here was an asymmetry that seemed to go along with the lateralization of human language. And in the process, in association with, the, with this area change, the whole configuration of the Sylvian fissure here on the lateral uh, surface of the brain changes in that if you have a big planum, it's long and straight going back this way, and if you have a small planum, it curls up here with uh, immediately behind sensory cortex and changes the configuration of this region of brain a great deal. And of course, that's the area of brain which has generally been associated based on uh, several centuries of, of uh, lesional literature. Uh, with the generation of language in the dominant hemisphere. So we, we have evidence now, and there's been uh, many uh, additional studies showing these kinds of asymmetries related to, to both the frontal and the temporal parietal representations of language. We have evidence that these, uh, uh, that this cortex is variant in terms of its morphology. Uh, and it's been possible to, to trace that to uh, chimps and orangutans because they have some asymmetry in this area, though not as dramatic as in humans. And it's been possible to look back in development and show that in the developing brain, this asymmetry appears pretty early. But a morphologic asymmetry, 
might not mean anything. It might just be an epiphenomenon. So the issue I want to talk to you about now is whether there are any functional consequences of these kind of uh, functional differences within this area of brain. And obviously, I wouldn't be talking here if there weren't. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and then speculate a little bit on the uh, consequences of that for uh, evolution of the human brain, and then a little bit about how it may have arisen based on some other systems that are nearby. Now, there are a different, lot of different ways of looking at functional localization, and this is fairly important because they give you different answers. One is what we've just talked about. The effects of lesions uh, tell you what's crucial for function at the time. There is another technique that'll give you this same information uh, that you can use in the intact person, well, during an operation on the intact uh, brain, uh, and that is electrical stimulation mapping. If you take a relatively high frequency current and apply it to the brain, you Produce, inhibit, you produce an inhibitory effect, you produce depolarization blockade, and you get what amounts to a temporary lesion at that point in time. Now that's different from the other ways of looking at this, which are basically physiologic correlates. That's what you do with the EEG or with the electrocorticography. Uh, it's what you do with single neuronal recording, which we will talk about a little bit later on. And it's, of course, what you do with the metabolic changes that you image with, FM, with the uh, fMR. Uh, and these are all changes that are associated uh, with the behavior, but they're not necessarily telling you what pieces are crucial for it. Uh, so, so what we're going to look at first is this technique and see if there's any, uh, if we get any variance with it and then how that might relate. And so here we are applying a small current at relatively high frequencies to the cortex. These are the recordings of the, the brainwave activity to tell us for sure we haven't evoked a seizure. Uh, this is done in procedures where the patient is awake under local anesthesia. That's fairly easy to do in the human brain because we have modern intravenous anesthetic agents where we can have the patient asleep for the craniotomy. Uh, we can uh, then uh, awaken them once all the pain-sensitive scalp and dural structures have been blocked, and the surface of the brain has no sensation. It feels neither touch nor pain because there are no sensors. Uh, and we can then have the patient reasonably comfortable for a period of time. And we use this because we, the brainwave information that we derive, we use to plan these operations. And the functional mapping nowadays is also used to avoid areas that we don't want to uh, uh, resect uh, for fear of, of significant uh, functional deficits like, uh, like deficits in language. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the, the population I'm mostly going to talk about are people with medically refractory epilepsy, where our problem, of course, is to identify in detail where the seizures are coming from based to the general area, of course, having been indicated by a fairly elaborate preoperative workup, and then to uh, uh, plan the, the resection. So here is the human uh, cortex the nose up here, the top of the head up here, the back of the head up here. Most of our data will be from temporal lobe because that is the common place where we see uh, medically refractory epilepsy with an identifiable focus. Uh, this is the left side. Doesn't come with the numbers. Uh, <laughs> now, if, if you, if you, well, it would be nice if it did, wouldn't it? Uh, if you apply a small current to the surface of the brain uh, in the uh, uh, quiet, otherwise quiet patient, you don't evoke anything from most of this. The only place where you evoke anything is, is motor and sensory cortex here, right here identified by the, the single digit numbers. In the rest of the brain, you don't get anything. The patient doesn't feel anything and, and nothing happens. But now if you have them engage in an ongoing language task, and for the initial studies here, we'll talk about simply naming pictures of common objects, you will find that there are selective sites here where you will interfere with that. You will, it, you, it activate this piece of cortex with your relatively high frequency current. We've used 60 hertz. Uh, and that, you, uh, e that some of these sites, the function will then fail uh, uh, after the application of the current. And here is that same patient. And here are the sites that we had stimulated. Here is the sylvian fissure. Here's some large surface veins we can use as landmarks. And here is a site where we got repeated interference. And all of these surrounding sites we didn't and another site, frontal site, so this would be Broca's area, this would be Wernicke's area, except in this patient it clearly is very small and instead of the rather large area that's classically been assigned to, to Wernicke's area. Furthermore, these things are really quite stable. 
Uh, this patient was seizure-free for a decade after my operation in 1983. Uh, they then recurred. We re-evaluated her with a little different technology where we put in a chronic array of electrodes, remapped her, and uh, 13 years later, here is the Sylvian fissure, uh, here is that surface vein, and here is the same pattern of, of sites. So, these crucial areas seem to be rather stable over time, and they, we, we're a, we've been able to show that they predict very well whether we, uh, our resection will or will not produce a deficit, and they are in fact used as a standard technique now for identifying language uh, with either uh, epilepsy surgery or tumor surgery if you have to work close to uh, language cortex. Now, we then looked at a series of 117 patients all of whom left, were left brain dominant uh, based on preoperative amitol assessment. And we simply looked at the variance in the localization of those sites. So what this shows, we arbitrarily assigned them to each of these zones uh, based on the uh, location of the central sulcus and the end of the sylvian fissure. And uh, this is the number of patients with a sample in that zone. And this is the percentage of that sample in which we got repeated interference with the, a naming task. And you can see that other than for a small area here in front of face motor cortex, which would presumably be the Broca area homologue, where about 80% of the patients had a deficit uh, or had interference, uh, there really is no area back in the temporal parietal area here where we consistently got uh, interference. And indeed, if you collapse down the whole superior temporal gyrus, so this whole region, which should include uh, the, the classical Wernicke's area, uh, you found that only about 65% of the patients had any site anywhere in it that, see, that produced uh, repeated interference uh, in this language task. So high functional, high variance in this functional test in terms of the localization of language across this uh, patient population. So then we looked at, at uh, some measures of a number of things. We looked at performance and gender uh, and any relationship to age. Uh, the only one I'm going to talk about is, is performance here. Uh, we had verbal IQ data on all these patients. That came as part of the preoperative workup. And so we used that as our measure of their verbal performance. It has uh, its defects, but it's at least a crude measure of that. And we simply we looked at the differences between patients with high and low verbal IQ. And we found that there were somewhat larger total language areas in those with lower, lower verbal IQs. And rather specifically, if we got naming sites in the superior temporal gyrus, uh, we, we were more likely to have, uh, the patient was more likely to have had a lower verbal IQ. Well, that was a neat hit, a neat, neat suggestion that maybe there was a functional relationship between some function that has, that, that uh, affects how the patient uh, might, might live, and these patterns of language localization that we were identifying. So then we went ahead, we had a series of patients in whom we had used not only naming, but a sentence reading task, so an, an even broader assessment of language. And this is just one such patient, uh, and as you can see, the reading, the sites where we interfere with reading are commonly somewhat separate from the sites where we interfere with naming. There are some common sites as well. Uh, and again, we can look at the patterns of localization uh, in different patients and compare that to the verbal IQ. And this is this should, just to show the variance, uh, again, that we get in both naming and reading. These are the black are the common sites, the white are just reading sites, the stippled are the uh, only naming sites. And again, you can see in the temporal parietal area a high degree of variance. Uh, the X's mark sites that are where there's a particularly high proportion of just reading sites. Uh, and then we then went and looked back at the verbal IQ, and we found again a pattern where the low, we split the group into those with high and those with low verbal IQs. Uh, the people with low verbal IQs tended to have naming only in the superior temporal gyrus and reading only in the middle gyrus. The reverse for, for patients who had high verbal IQs, naming only in the middle gyrus, reading only in the superior gyrus. The full pattern was in a relatively smallish number uh, of the subjects, but we had none that showed any the opposite pattern. And portions of the pattern, either the naming or reading portion, were present in a goodly number of them, uh, with very few showing a reverse pattern. So again, a, a relationship between the pattern of stimulation that we had evoked, uh, of stimulation interference we'd evoked uh, in these patients and their verbal IQs. <coughs> 
So we have evidence of anatomic and functional variability in this posterior temporal cortex. And with this high variance, one of the hypotheses is that this is a sign of relatively recent, uh, recent uh, appearance of this uh, in an evolutionary sense, uh, in that it hasn't settled down into any uh, consistent pattern across the population. Uh, and of course, in our current culture, uh, over about the last perhaps five generations or so, there is a tendency to sort people at the time they pick mates based on their scholastic aptitude. And whatever you think of the verbal IQ, it's actually a pretty good predictor of whether you're going to go to college or not. Uh, so that we now have the population sorted in a way with the people with one pattern are who are likely to have one pattern are going to mate with somebody who's likely to have that pattern, and the people who uh, have the other pattern are likely to mate with the other. And uh, one would predict then that the evolution of this part of cortex perhaps should accelerate. Now, let me turn then to the question of could this system of the, the, this variant piece of cortex with this pattern of, of localization which is related to function, could this system have arisen out of two older systems, one of which is a cortical system for uh, oral facial motor control, and the other a cortical system for recent, verbal, me recent uh, verbal memory? And here is the data. If you take a patient and you now look at a range of language functions, and in this case, the two different, we're naming in two different languages. We're looking at sentence reading, and we're looking at a recent verbal memory measure. We had the patient mimic a set of oral facial sequences of, of, of uh, b both re sing repeating one, move, one uh, oral facial movement and then a sequence of movements. These are the movements that you have to make to generate the motor aspects of language. And then we used a, we, we looked at their ability to identify phonemes. One of the beauties of stimulation is you can turn it on and off. And so we could use a thing called the stip consonant identification task. That's asking you to identify ACMA, ADMA, ATMA to pick up the stop consonant. And we could stimulate at the time they heard it. And we could then have a response period without interference uh, when they could tell us whether, which uh, stop consonant it was. And rather to our surprise, we found that in temporal parietal cortex, which is after all in the classic model supposed to be a cortex involved with perception, but not production. We interfered with both perception and production. And as you'll see in a moment when I show you the data from a series of patients, uh, it's a very common association. Uh, and that uh, was in a situation where most of the other functions here, we only altered at single different sites. Here only reading, here only naming, actually only naming in one language, here only naming in another language, here only performance on the recent verbal memory test. So here are the sites where we have the interference with oral facial motor mimicry, the blue sites where we interfere with any kind of mimicry, and that's presumably a final motor pathway uh, for uh, oral facial motor control, but then the green sites, the sites where we interfere with the ability to sequence uh, the uh, uh, oral facial movements. And as you see, a very high percentage of these sites, we also got motor changes. Uh, we, also, we also got uh, phoneme changes, which suggests that this cortex is involved in both the production and perception of speech, rather than uh, this uh, posterior perception, anterior production dichotomy. Now, uh, if you look at, if you, you look at the performance on the verbal memory measures, you also find there are sites where you interfere just with that, and here was one such site. The way the measure we've used on this is an encoding storage retrieval measure, and then we compare activity during encoding to activity uh, during uh, and its memory for four names in this case, and we look we compared it to the activity during naming alone, and what you find is that the sites where you interfere with memory are, are often different from the sites where you interfere with just straight naming. And here is that data, again, across a series of 14 patients, uh, and you find that this is the center is the proportion with naming deficits. Here are some sites where you have predominant naming changes. Here are the sites with predominant memory changes. That's the outer ring. Most of the, the majority of the changes are during the encoding and storage phase, stimulation then uh, in temporal lobe, the retrieval phase in frontal lobe, and very little, relatively little overlap uh, 
between the memory and naming errors, even though you're basically doing the same thing in the two tasks, except in one, you've been instructed to also remember the name. Now, if you plot those, and if we get in 14 cases here, here are the places where we get the short-term memory change, here are the places where we got the motor changes, and these orange areas are the areas where we get specialized changes in language and where much of that morphologic change that I showed and much of the variance in localization of language uh, seems to occur. And so there are sites here where we get only syntactic changes, sites where we get only naming changes uh, in, in this more specialized cortex. And so the hypothesis is that the, we have evidence for the sequential motor perceptual system and surrounding recent memory system and these specialized regions for language between them in temporal lobe. And so the idea is that this specialized and variant cortex, both functionally and, and structurally variant, has arisen from these two motor and memory systems. So now the present, you would hypothesize they should be present in non-human animals and that's what we need to look at. Now the problem is there isn't a whole lot of lesion or stimulation mapping data from the non-human animals. So to establish this, we've got to turn to a different comparison. And in this case, the recording of neuronal activity. Uh, we have undertaken over the last some decades uh, human neuronal recording during various cognitive measures during the awake neurosurgical procedures. And here is uh, just an example of that happening. And it's extracellular recording. And these are the kind of, of uh, action potential recordings you get uh, while the patient performs a, uh, a language measure. Uh, and, uh, and so we looked at the, the patterns of activity. And this is on a simple task of auditory word listening and then uh, uh, overtly repeating the, the item that was presented. So a series of words are presented. Uh, and then we present the same words again with the instruction to repeat them. So we have a measure during both perception and during expression. And here is some recordings from the dominant uh, superior temporal gyrus. And here is the activity during perception. Uh, perception alone, perception uh, when it's also coupled with expression, and here the activity during repeating. So we have neurons that seem to be active, uh, not a huge number, but some, that seem to be active with both perception and expression. Now, what can you say about non-human animals? Well, there's quite a lot of single unit uh, data from non-human animals. Uh, a lot of it has been directed at looking at areas where you can generate, the animals generate spontaneous calls. That seems to have no parallel to human language. It's in totally different parts of the brain. It's mostly along the mesial bank uh, of the hemisphere in the frontal lobe, uh, not at all in this lateral parasylvian area where we've been, uh, where you get uh, aphasic syndromes and we get the mapping changes. Uh, but there are this phenomenon of mirror neurons, which has been a very popular phenomenon in the, in the, in the uh, uh, last uh, decade and a half or so, uh, recorded in inferior frontal, superior temporal sulcus, and parietal lobe in monkey. These were originally identified as active with movement and observing the same movement. And this generated a lot of thought that maybe language had been acquired by uh, on a, on a mimicking oral facial gestures. But there's a very interesting more recent study showing that these uh, neurons also respond to the sound of the movement. And that seems much more logical uh, that they would represent a link between the perception of the sound and the motor output. Uh, it is not a lateralized system in humans, at least based on fMRI studies. Unfortunately, this was done with finger movement rather than oral facial movement which uh, perhaps would be more relevant. Uh, and, uh, but at least so far, the evidence of laterality uh, is not present in, the, in uh, this system, either in, in monkey or in humans. But then again, human temporal lobe neuronal activity uh, recorded during language measures is also not lateralized. The same proportion occur on both sides. There are differences related to dominance. And as, as I guess you all know, the uh, human language is, is nearly, not quite, but nearly all uh, uh, the, the lesion effects at least all localized to the, the uh, left hemisphere. Uh, and uh, in our uh, single neuronal recordings at least, the things that related to dominance were early inhibition. 
So activity changes occurring early and relative inhibition during the language task were the things that seemed to be a characteristic of the dominant temporal lobe. Those things uh, now uh, have basically not been observed in the animal motor system. Now what about the, at least uh, in, in monkey, what about uh, the memory system? Well, uh, in humans we've used an encoding storage retrieval uh, system and we have compared the single unit activity during encoding to that uh, during identification of the same material without the instruction to retain it in memory. You get activity like this, here's identification, here's the changes during encoding, storage and recall, highly significant for different kinds of uh, material to be retained. Other times you get inhibition here for some modalities but not others. And if you record from a large number of neurons, you find that a very large per percentage of those neurons in lateral temporal cortex change activity uh, with this uh, during the encoding measure. So what about m rats and monkeys and humans? Well, uh, traditionally, of course, temporal lobe uh, memory performance has been related to hippocampus. That seems pretty similar across the three species. Uh, you get deficits with it in all three species, few lesion in the hippocampus. Uh, and uh, the anatomy is pretty similar in all three, and it's probably relatively conserved. Uh, cortex, on the other hand, is very different across the three species. The area related to memory uh, is present in, all, in both rats, monkeys, and humans, but it's very small in the rat. It's larger in the monkey, uh, and it's much larger in the human. Of course, the whole temporal lobe is much larger in the, in the human as well. Uh, and if you look at the physiology, you find that there's a higher percentage of neurons changing activity in the human versus that that's been reported in the monkey. Uh, but uh, the, what's, what's uh, present in the human that has not been present in, in any of the monkey recordings is the presence of modality specificity or the evidence for uh, lateralization of this verbal memory system. So we have evidence of this parasite, the sequential motor perceptual system and recent memory system surrounding those specialized regions. We have evidence that the specialized region shows sub substantial functional and anatomic variants, uh, suggesting that it may have evolved relatively recently and certainly some reason to think that it may be evolving even faster. Uh, and that we have somewhat similar motor and memory systems present in the non-human animals with this specialized cortex seeming to have developed between those systems that have an, uh, for which we can get evidence uh, in uh, earlier forms. Thanks a lot. Thank you.